Well, I would just start out by saying Steffi deserves a lot of congratulations, in my opinion, for putting climate so central to this conference, in, which is really kind of a step forward. It's been part of DLD before, but I think as Sandrine and others have explained earlier today, this is no joke. We have to focus on this as a central concern for all of us. One thing I was going to ask you all, if you knew that today and yesterday were the hottest May days Munich has had in 30 years. So this is happening all around us. New York is going to be in the 90s tomorrow which is also highly atypical and disturbing. So we are in a crisis. And as Sandrine also said, our lives are in our hands. And I think that's the attitude that we hope every company as well as every individual would adopt. I don't think we would say that's the case. But we have here two companies, two of the world's most important, largest companies, both of which are really doing a lot and are thinking very hard about how to do more. So as, as Steffi said, we have Sabine Klauke, who's CTO of Airbus, and Werner Vogels, who's CTO of Amazon. Um, Werner made a great point during the prep that the two industries that they represent are the worst polluting industries in the world. Cloud services and data centers generally and, and airlines, uh, and you know, flying. It's terrible as a polluting thing. Of course, we all love it, we use it, but we know it's terrible. We, most of us, it, it is the most climate unfriendly thing we do individually is to fly. So Sabine has a lot of thoughts about how that might change, and we hope she succeeds. Um, I guess I'd just love to um, start by asking you both to talk about, at the big level, how you think about technology as a tool for climate action, which is the topic of our session. Well, let me first kill that, that statement that I said yes. earlier. Yeah, let me just be... Should I, I edit said that, that as a public perception. It is actually the inverse. It's the opposite. It's not true. Now, let, me, let, me, let me take an analogy. Who of you here has a car? Ah, oh, come on, be honest. Yeah? And uh, if you're lucky, you use your car 5% of the time. Yeah? Now imagine you're driving your driveway, a car wouldn't shut off, it would stay idle for the whole day. That's the analogy to corporate data centers. Yeah? Basically, if you talk to a CIO, and if he's a really good CIO, he will tell you that his utilization is somewhere between 50 and 20, 15 and 20 percent. That basically means that 80 percent of the energy that is pumped through their servers doesn't do any work at all. And so by moving, actually, your workloads over to a shared provider or a shared infrastructure, a cloud, AWS in this particular case, um, you will uh, improve the carbon efficiency of your workloads by 80% at this moment. It's mostly because AWS has this, set this goal for being completely off uh, on renewable energy by 2025. We may hit that earlier wow. um, with the largest the largest corporate purchaser of renewable energy in the world. We have 310 projects going on at this particular moment to generate renewable energy, so we're investing in that. And actually, sort of this, this massive high utilization that you can get out of the cloud means that you can get tremendous utilization improvement and, as such, a carbon reduction. So I clearly misstated my point when I was <laughs> quoting you. It's not cloud that is the polluting industry, it's data centers it's that data are the polluting industry. And, and that is what you said, so I stand corrected. But one of the things you also said that I, I asked you, I don't know how many people here know, I would assume the number was greater, but the percentage of corporate computing that has by now moved to the cloud is what, Werner? It is infancy. I think it is, if we look, it's between 5 and 10 percent. Even still, oh, less no, than 10% no, no. of corporate computing is I'm, in the cloud. You know, imagine most of these corporations have made massive investments in existing infrastructure. Yeah. Just leaving that behind is not something that you do. It's Plus, painful. There's a lot of gravity associated with it. People know what to do. People know how to hook servers. Yeah. They know they're familiar with that. And it's, it's, it's a long path that we're going through to move people to a more efficient infrastructure. Yeah, and in fact, Airbus is in the middle of that transition as an AWS customer. Uh, so, Sabine, how does Airbus think about this issue in a big picture way? 
Yeah, and I really wanted to do the link here. You said we are in infancy in using, actually, the new technology. And if I tell you that over the last 30 years, we have gained 50% in emissions, in efficiency in for a single aircraft. So now, how many of the newest generation aircraft with a step up of 25% efficiency are flying? Maybe 15, 20%. So here, yeah, by just taking the newest generation aircraft, we can, we can save a lot. But of course, this is not sufficient because we all know that, that this is still uh, CO2 emit emitting. So we have taken an ambition just before the crisis, it was actually, where we said we want to be flying the first zero emission aircraft in commercial aircraft, so the big aircraft. And we want to do that and have that in the market ready by 2035. Wow. So that may seem long away, but it is actually very short. And we are at the moment in this full roadmap, and we actually have com continued and committed to do so even through the crisis, which was a huge crisis for, for aviation. It was the biggest that we ever, ever have seen. And this means for us, if we really want to go zero emission, and we have heard about sustainable aviation fuels and the things which we can step by step do, that means we need to change the energy source. And the energy source, this is one of the things, I think, which is in the minds of, of all of us. And, and here, the most promising for us is actually hydrogen. So if we want to use hydrogen for flying, then yes, we do think today the technology is ready and it's used in other industries. Because if you burn hydrogen, it's zero emissions. Yeah. Exactly. This is the only way to really go zero emission. But we need to actually transfer that into aviation. So we need the safety requirements and we need to look how we transport it. It will be liquid hydrogen, so we need tanks. Liquid hydrogen means cryogenic, so really very cold. We need to distribute it in the aircraft. That means that we really have to manage pressure and temperature well. Uh, we need to adapt the engines. If we want to use engines, we could also use fuel cells. So there's a lot of technology bricks that we have to mature in, in parallel in order to get there. And that's actually what's ongoing just now. In a lot of little and big demonstrators, we will fly the first time in, in 2026. And before we then can actually choose how exactly this aircraft will look like and, and hopefully launch the program. So that's actually the ambition that we've taken. And this is um, so much relying on technologies and as well actually on digital te technologies to make it all work, that we are really stepping up into, into this responsibility. And you're doing a huge amount just building the ecosystem as well as developing the technology, because you, you said you're working with airports in Seoul and a bunch of other places. Tokyo, was that one of them? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point that you actually make. If you're wanting to do that, it doesn't help that we only have a, an aircraft which could fly hydrogen. We also need to be ready in all in the different airports, in the in the ecosystem. We need to be able to certify an aircraft like this. We need to have enough green hydrogen, actually. And and this is right. We are working with the whole ecosystem. It is an industry-wide problem, and and actually. We are having alliances with the, with the hydrogen producers, the airports, and different airlines as well in order to make it happen, in order to get prepared. Get prepared, and the, even the airports are ready today. So for instance, Singapore, uh, Seoul as well. Um, and that's actually going around the whole world because we need this worldwide playing field. Yeah, and of course, we don't really know how to make hydrogen efficiently at the moment. Can I add something to, to that? It, it, it's the ecosystem that is really important. Yeah, so exactly. especially when you build air, aircraft, I think you guys have 4,000 or 8,000 partners or something like that to help you build the aircraft, basically. So we build data centers and fulfillment centers. So that seems like normal, you know, just big concrete blocks. Now, the reducing the amount of concrete actually significantly reduces the amount of CO2 pollution that you yes. get. Uh -huh. uh, you can make decisions about get, getting your steel from electric arc steel mills instead of traditional steel mills. So there is in your partner ecosystem a lot of things that you can do to really make a change in the way that you build very traditional conservative buildings. Oh. <laughs> I, I could hear you. Were you hearing him? 
Okay. Well, use well, the mic anyway. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now we really hear you. Go ahead. No, that was all. I just wanted to add to the whole thing, it's not just us, it's our ecosystem around us that we have to influence and make sure that they do the right things or pick the right partners, they can do these things. Right. Um, one of the things you talked about, Werner, uh, and that Amazon is doing in a very interesting way is thinking about giving customers choices regarding the carbon consequences of their usage. So, and, 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 and talk about the pressure you've gotten from your own engineers to do that, and also what you're doing. Uh, so yeah, so there's, there's, you, I would describe it as a shared responsibility model. So we, as AWS, are responsible for the data center, the networks, security, all these kind of things. And we're also responsible for innovation in that world. So that means good water management. Yeah, uh, using recycled water instead of uh, water that you can actually drink. Um, uh, build new processors. You know, if you're actually doing machine learning and you're using GPUs, GPUs are extremely inefficient, power-hungry machines. And as such, we build dedicated chips like Tranium and Inference that are, m for machine learning, much lower power chips. Or we build our ARM processors. So we're responsible for all of that. We took all the, ju the UPSs out of, so the uninterruptible power supplies, that used to be a general sort of facility in your data center. Now each of our rack has a small one, and it means you can save 35% on your energy conversion. Wow. That is enormous change, so we're responsible for that. We do the innovation in data centers. Then our customers have to come, and as well as, of course, automatic services and software and other things like that are really optimized. Then our customers come, and they need to make the right choices for them. Yeah, can you run on ARM? Can you, do, do you just want to do lift and shift? Do you want to re-architecture? Um, what's the best processor to pick? What are the best, um, uh, do you go serverless or do you buy virtual machines or do you go containers? And what are the impact of each of those architectural choices on your carbon footprint? And, and that's one, so that's the, the shared response, that's the traditional shared responsibility model. I actually put another layer on top of that. I actually think that we have become addicted to extremely fast web pages, to beautiful layouts, massive imagery, video on every page. Do you know how much that costs in terms of carbon footprint? Well, if you would go from a 1.2 median, uh, uh, let's say, latency on your web page to 1.5, it would probably, you would consume less energy, less carbon, and maybe it has a little bit of impact on your conversion but maybe that's a decision you want to make. So I want to give my customers the tools and the mechanisms to make choices for themselves. And, you know, there's lots of companies that are actually really focusing on sustainability, often because it's also matched with efficiency. Um, but definitely their customers, individuals, us, who are using these services, are asking them to be more sustainable or demonstrate to them what they are doing to become more sustainable. Well, this is very pertinent to what Sabine was saying, too, because obviously both of your customers are themselves being asked to do carbon accounting, and they have to figure out how to remediate their emissions at all stages for the supply chain and the customer use, etc. So this is a pressure on you as well, right? Of course, and, and this is really, I think, what we have in common. It is all about energy at the end. Energy is the central question of, of the future. And we need technology in order to go forward, to optimize um, our design, to optimize the, the different aircraft and, and other products that we are using. So, but we need to see how do we get the right level of green energy, and then how do we intelligently use it. And here, I want to do another analogy with, with nature. So if you're looking at what can be the most efficient way of flying, then it's also really looking into nature, and we call that biomimicry. So actually looking at birds, which are our <laughs> big idols <laughs> that we have in nature, and can we actually improve the wings even further? So we are looking into aeroelastic wings that can change their form actually during flight, just as, a, as eagles when they soar. So we, we would have movables that, that can, can change the size of the, of the wings during flight whenever there is a, a specific uh, gust coming, so we could actually adapt to that in order to, in order to be more efficient. So by these things, 
each time you can gain a, another 5% and another 5%. Another example was actually, we are looking at geese when they fly. So, so they have this format flights where they really actually use most efficiently their, their muscle energy. So we have done the first flight across the Atlantic, coupling two big aircraft, two A350, two long haul aircraft. And, and this is, of course, using a lot of technology to calculate, to have the right positioning. Like it's a software just as challenge. Like, like autonomous uh, driving. Yeah, you just do it with flying. And here, again, this is bringing us into how do we use the technology to make it better and then to use it in the most intelligent way to, to use less. So here, again, we've, we, we, can, we can actually gain six tons in one flight across the Atlantic. It's, it's, it's really interesting all the different ways that you can find to save energy once you start evaluating it methodically. I think both of your companies are finding that. Yeah. Did you want to jump in or should I ask you a question? Oh, no, no. I, I think, you know, this, we, we're often stuck in sort of old way thinking. Yeah. It, it's like, um, oh, this is all, we've always flown our aircraft to 10,000 feet. Yeah. And so why don't we reconsider that? Is that really the place where you should be flying if you want, if, let's say, sustainability becomes your goal? Um, well, another form is, of course, that energy storage or electricity storage should be in batteries. Right, okay, let's go there. That's, that's, <laughs> that's sort of, that's the, the general thinking. Batteries are extremely toxic. Getting rid of all of the batteries that are now in all the electric cars 10 years from now, it's going to be a very interesting challenge. Not to mention getting the minerals to build them in the first place, you know, too. Oh, that, you know, it doesn't scale. Yeah. So, for example, we have a 300 megawatt renewable plant in Texas. We also build a 150 megawatt storage facility for, that elect for the electricity. Yeah, and, and as such, you know, we have to start thinking about differently. It doesn't necessarily need to be batteries. I mean, two years ago, it was here at DLD that the, the, where you actually transform electricity into kinetics, yeah, whether it's with, with concrete blocks. Bill or Gross you push was here talking. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so uh, as such, we need to innovate on things that we think are standard. Yeah. yeah, this is how we do things. You know, if you look in the old trams, they used to be flywheels. Yeah, and so the moment that they would be braking, the flywheel would spin up, and they would use that, the energy from the braking to actually get the tram rolling again. And so all of these sort of principles that we used to have, we have to sort of rethink them. But and this, I, is, yeah. this is actually another, another principle that we are using if we look at hybrid electric. We will, we will have very e quickly physical limits in flying as to how much batteries or energy and electrical energy we can bring in. But we very well can use fuel cells where we actually transform hydrogen into electric uh, energy. And we can also use hybrid electric ways where we actually optimize the peaks. Yes, yeah? so you need a lot of energy when you take off, but you can actually help there as well with electric energy yeah? to couple these. And then during the flight, you would, yeah, you would then recharge again. And again, you can do that with batteries, but you can do also do it with fuel cells. And Sabine, you agree with Werner, too, that batteries, in effect, are a crude and in even unacceptable technology for the long term, right? For me, it's a clear transition technology. We need it today because uh, that's, that's what helps us in the short term. And if you look at, at air quality in the cities, of course, we want it. Then is it the best in the overall cycle? Uh, we can question it. What about SAF, which we heard about from Lufthansa earlier, sustainable aviation fuel? How do you think about that? Is that a long-term solution? Is that a transitional one? So we definitely think that there is no one silver bullet to make, uh, to make it in, in aviation. So we do think we need all these technologies to make aircraft lighter and more efficient. We need step changes like hydrogen, but we also need sustainable aviation fuels because they are available now. The technology is there. We need to uptake the, yeah, the availability and the usage of it. And also for the long haul flights, we will, we will need it for quite some time still. So this is a mix of things that we need to do. And then last but not least, optimizing the operations, as we have seen some of the examples, being better in, in the alignment and the air traffic management so that we get rid of these waiting, uh, waiting loops, for instance, and, and all these kind of things. So we so need it all. So it's more ecosystem work. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, working even with air traffic, that's not something we think of an aircraft manufacturer doing. Werner, one of, we're unfortunately short on time, but one of the things you were mentioning that I thought was really interesting was the idea of re-evaluating software itself for efficiency, given that so much of it is so old and was written with no concern for efficiency. Uh, yeah, or sustainability. Yeah? I mean, <laughs> we often fix the view for confluate those two things. And so, um, yeah, uh, I think uh, one of the things that, that if you look at, for example, many HPC, high performance computing applications, fluid dynamics, things like that, are, uh, are built, are actually built in Fortran probably 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, those algorithms haven't changed much. But the implementation of it, it's probably quite, quite good, different architectures. So you can make use of machine learning tools, for example, to inspect existing software and find those bottlenecks where you could make improvement just for efficiency reasons. Wow. And, and, or use managed services instead of actually doing it yourself and things like that. Okay. So there's a few things I want to sort of end on, given that it's... Yeah. So one of them is uh, Amazon has a climate uh, uh, pledge fund um, of two billion for innovation in, for example, electricity. Or just in climate electricity, tech. Just, yeah. just in climate tech. Just for any startup to sort of apply to. The other thing is the open sustain the Amazon sustainability, open susta sustainability data initiative. We have tons of data sets from around the world that are continuously being updated. There's open data for everybody to use to research on. It's weather data. It's farm data. It's um, satellite data, it is ocean uh, temperatures, it's all the sustainability, all the climate data that you want is available as open data sets on AWS for anybody to use for free. Wow. So go do your research. Really good. Any final thoughts, Sabine? Yeah, I think, so we just had our 50th birthday and around that we rethought and we thought about our, what is our, our sense of being. And what we really think and, and have put in the center is actually we pioneer sustainable aviation for a safe and united world. And this is really our dream and our core and center. And I think if we could find a way that our children, and my daughter is just five, that they can use and fly in the, exactly the same conscious way than we were able to discover the world, then I think we have made our game. Awesome. I hope all companies can start to think with as much seriousness about this as your two companies. So thank you so much. Um, I guess we got to wrap. But I didn't know, I just wanted to say, those of you who've been at DLD for many years know that it's really operating very much on time today, which is relatively unusual. And you know why? The music starts at 30 seconds before you're over. I hadn't heard that from where I was sitting, but it's very effective. Thank <laughs> you.